morning scripture reading comes from the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John. I'll be reading verses 20 through 33. Listen now for God's word to us through these words of St. John. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, thank you for these words. And thank you for your promised living word. And so it is our prayer that as these words are proclaimed that by the power of your Spirit at work in, among, around, and above us, that your living word will come to us and renew and refresh and restore and challenge us to follow you and be your disciples. And now may the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus is nearly out of time, and he knows it. It is six days before the Passover festival begins. According to John's gospel, Palm Sunday has already happened. Jesus is already in the holy city. And this time, he won't make it out alive, at least not in any conventional sense. There's an interesting story right at the beginning of this text about some Greeks who wish to see Jesus. Here we are at the end of Jesus' life, watching the beginning of His ministry to the Gentiles like us. Here, late in John's gospel, is our invitation to follow Him and be His disciples. It would be really interesting to know what, if any, conversation these Greeks and Jesus had with one another, but John doesn't let us know. This doesn't seem to be the time for that conversation. No, John tells us at this point that Jesus says both to no one and, and everyone at the same time, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father, will honor Here we have, in just a few short sentences, Jesus telling His audience what is about to happen to Him as well as what needs to happen to them if they wish to be His disciples. Here we find the great paradox of our faith, that we gain our lives by giving them away, that our sacrifices are what set us free. Well, you can imagine how strange what Jesus said sounded to those who were listening to it for the first time. Especially the part that Jesus was saying about Himself. This talk about the Son of Man would would have meant nothing to those Greeks, but it would have meant everything to the Jews. Because it was part of an ancient biblical prophecy first found in the book of Daniel. Daniel, while in one of his prophetic visions during the Babylonian exile some 600 years before, imagined someone that he called like a man coming out of heaven and appearing before God. This is the one that they ended up calling the Son of Man. And this is what Daniel says about this prophecy. He says, To the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and His kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. It was commonly believed that when this Son of Man finally appeared, the golden age of Israel would begin and it would have no end. And so we see that, that Jesus is saying not just one, but three radical things in these few verses. He is saying that He is the Son of Man. He's saying that the Son of Man will die, and he's saying, perhaps most remarkably, that it is in his death that God will be glorified. While it was common belief that the Son of Man would come one day, no one thought or could even imagine that the Son of Man would die. And yet that's what Jesus claims is about to happen. It's hard to overstate just how shocking these words would have sounded to his original audience. But if we're honest with ourselves, it's still shocking to us today. The part about Jesus dying... And the part about us having to die to ourselves. After Jesus says those words about who He is and what's about to happen, He says, Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? And we can certainly relate. We can understand why Jesus is hesitating when He is faced with the stark reality of what is about to happen. That's what we say to ourselves when we're faced with similar choices. What are we going to do? Will we do the easy thing or the hard thing? Will we do the selfish thing or the sacrificial thing? Will we do the life-protecting thing or the life-giving thing? Will we glorify ourselves or will we seek to glorify God? 
Well, we know what Jesus chose. Jesus said, no, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. When I was ordained nearly 30 years ago, the pastor that I was about to work with in Cartersville was the one who gave my ordination charge. I'll never forget what he said at the very end of the charge. He said, Tim, no matter what, remember this. Never touch the glory because it doesn't belong to you. And here's what I've learned in those 30 years since I first heard him say that. That that's not something you can decide once and be done with it. It's a decision you have to make each And every day. Who will I seek to glorify? God or myself? And if you don't know the answer to that question, well, then, my friend, I'm afraid you've just answered the question. Dick Hoyt died last week at the age of 80. You may not know the name but you've probably seen the picture. The picture of a father pushing his son in a wheelchair across the finish line at the Boston Marathon. Dick and Ricky Hoyt became such fixtures at the Boston Marathon that in 2013, they cast a bronze statue of the two of them to be near the the starting line of the race. They say that Dick Hoyt died of congestive heart failure, which I find hard to believe because I don't know any athlete with a bigger heart than Dick Hoyt. And even though his heart may have given up, his heart never gave out. Dick Hoyt didn't mean to be an inspiration to millions of people. That wasn't the plan for his life. He was just trying to be a good father. And when his son Ricky was born in 1962 with cerebral palsy and a quadriplegic and unable to speak, Dick Hoyt never gave up on trying to communicate with his son. And then one day, these engineers at Tufts University developed a computer that enabled Ricky to communicate. They gave it to the family. And then Ricky was able to tell his father what he wanted to do. And what Ricky Hoyt wanted to do was run. So that's what they did. The two of them for 37 years. They finished 32 Boston marathons. And thousands of other races from 5Ks to full Ironman triathlons. You can say that Dick Hoyt gave up his life for his son, Ricky. But then in turn, Ricky gave his father a new life. A better life. A life richer and more rewarding than Dick had ever imagined. I got the title for this sermon from that famous line in Winston Churchill's speech right before the Battle of Britain. This was before Pearl Harbor, before the United States was in the war. England was all by itself fighting against the Nazi menace. The fury of the Luftwaffe was about to be unleashed upon the British people beginning with London and then going through the countryside, hopefully breaking their spirits right before a planned land invasion of the island. Great Britain was outgunned, outmunitioned, outmanned, outspent, and nearly out of time. And into that darkness, Winston Churchill says these words of light. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. 
The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth lasts for a thousand years, this hour. And they did, and it was. Well, I believe that what we have here is Jesus' final hour. Because it's the hour that he faces his darkest fears and yet chooses to trust in the goodness of God. It is the hour that Jesus chooses death over life, trusting that God will choose life over death. It is the hour that Jesus chooses us over himself, trusting that no act of love is ever wasted. It is the hour that gives us hope, always, and especially now. It is not only Jesus' finest hour, but it is our finest hour. Because of what He does for us. It is the hour that saves us. This is what Jesus says at the end of it. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to Myself. That means even Greeks who come late to the party like us. And because this is His finest hour and our finest hour, then it also enables us to follow Jesus and to give our lives away to someone else, trusting that on the other side of that there is a new and better life a life richer and more rewarding than we ever imagined. No, the Boston Marathon won't be the same without Dick Hoyt. But it also won't be the same because of him. It will be infinitely much better. Because what Dick Hoyt taught the people of Boston, and indeed anyone who ever saw him, was that there is something better than winning a race all by yourself. There is losing one for someone you love. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us here from the sanctuary at Northwest Presbyterian Church. I hope you found a sustaining and strengthening word from God. If you like what you heard, I hope that you will consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if you click on the bell icon, you'll be notified of new videos as soon as they get uploaded. Whether you're watching from Atlanta or from far away, we're so glad you've chosen to become part of our extended church family. And if you have a prayer concern, know that we would love to be praying with you and for you. You may email the church office at nwpc at nwpcatlanta.org put prayer request in the subject line, and know that we will be praying for you. I hope you'll worship with us again and often, and I hope one day I'll get to meet you face to face. But until then, I wish you all of God's good blessings. Goodbye. <laughs>